This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. This episode, episode 54, builds on the last one, where again, I'm looking to emphasize some of the areas of mental toughness which aren't necessarily considered. When people get stuck with the notion that mental toughness is all about gritting it out, working hard, and getting your head down. So the bit that they miss is around communication. Communication in a social setting. So interpersonal confidence. And in the first clip, that I'm going to highlight, Jamie Forrester discusses the need to have confidence in yourself in social situations if you're going to succeed in professional football. Paul McGee goes on to discuss how you can help yourself, especially when you're approached by intimidating people. And then we've got Mark Bennett, who highlights some ideas for parents, for coaches, and leaders, helping you consider if your behaviors are aligned in order to support success. Here's Jamie Forrester now. Or 13 in my case. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. (laughs) So I imagine you settled in quite well in some clubs fairly quickly and in other clubs it might have been more difficult. Do you want to just share some of those experiences? Yeah, I mean, it's it's, as, as, as I'll become more experienced by going to different clubs and new dressing rooms, it became, it became easier, really. I was, I was always and remain a, quite a confident person socially, so I never really had any problems ingratiating myself into a first-team squad. Sometimes it was, it was harder than others, you know, based on different situations. You might come into a club where, a manager's under pressure and you're straight in the first team. You might come into a club where you're not straight in the first team and you have to fight your way into the team. There's lots and lots of different dynamics. I mean, there's there's some dressing rooms I've played in that are absolutely fantastic and we had great social lives and those other dressing rooms I played in where it was just really hard work and not particularly enjoyable. And you have to find a way. I think part of being a professional footballer is learning how to adapt and play within a team environment. And sometimes you have to, you have to just suck it up and get on with it really. Um, I mean, we'd all prefer to be in a great dressing room where we get on with everyone, but the reality is that that doesn't happen. And there are people, you know, we, 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 nobody gets on with everybody, especially in the sporting environment. that's so cutthroat. I mean, if you just take the average squad of, of 20 players, and I'm a striker, there's going to be three or four strikers, sometimes five, maybe one that comes on loan. So your teammates are also your competition. Um, although it is a team sport, it's very much an individual mindset where, you know, <laughs> you are playing for yourself. I know that's not particularly the, the thing that is said in public very often, but any footballer will tell you you have to you have to create your own career and you have to be single minded and that creates a certain mindset and it's all about survival. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? That I suppose that single minded mindset in, in Yeah, because yeah, I mean I have gone to clubs and they've had, say, three or four strikers. Well, I need to be one of those two strikers in the first team. So although these guys are my teammates, I, I have to find a way of elevating myself or adding value to the team or the squad to make sure that I'm in that starting lineup. Because if I am and I'm scoring goals, things are great and I'll get a new contract or a move. And if not, then <laughs> I'll be out and I'll have <laughs> to find somewhere else. And things are, things are slightly less certain. So I'll, I'll give you a story, but not my story, but a really good friend of mine, a club, I won't give you his name or the club, but he was, he was a central midfielder. Um, quite combative, bit of a tackler, but could play. And he got suspended and he was out of the team for three or four games. And he came and he came back and he did, didn't get straight back in the team. They had a few, they might have won a couple of games. He needed to be in that team. He went to see the manager and he said, right, I am going to, in training, go around kicking every single midfielder until you put me back in the team. Just want to let you know, 
I want to get back in this team. I'm going to go around kicking everyone until they're either injured or you get me back in the team. So a couple of aspects to that. One, the manager absolutely loved that type of attitude. Loved it. Because that's him saying, I want to play for you. I want to be in that team. And two, what a strong mindset, single-minded to make sure he's back in that team. And he was within two weeks. (laughs) It might not be politically correct, but he's there as an individual to make the most of his career. And the longer he's out of the team, the more unpredictable things can be. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. He's certainly shown the, the desire. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose I'm, I'm questioning the fact he's going to go around kicking his uh, teammates, mind you. But yeah. maybe, it was a, maybe it was just a threat. <laughs> but yeah. <Or> not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, depending on his, on his character. But, but ultimately, yeah, it is sending that message to the to the manager, isn't it? That I really want to be there and I'm going to do anything I can to, yeah. to, to prove you where uh, you're wrong. And just while I'm on that, I think as a player, I've sort of really learned this towards the end of my career. And even since retired, I, I never saw managers as human beings. I always saw them as this very strong alpha male type character. I think what I learned as I got older and into my late years and since retirement, managers are human and they want when they pick a team, they want to pick a team on people they trust and they can rely on. And they would happily, I think, compensate for somebody that's not as good, that they know will give them a solid seven out of 10 every week than somebody that gives them a three out of 10 one week, a 10 out of 10 one week, a four out of 10 the week after, a nine out of 10. So when you realize that managers are human, you, you then you then tailor your approach and go, well, they just want somebody they can trust. So I'm going to be that guy that they can trust. So I'm going to work hard. You know, you, you, you see things a little bit differently, or I did. At the end of the day, the, the manager's job, again, is, is very cutthroat as well, isn't it? So, so like you say, they are going to rely on those, on those players who can give them a consistent performance. Absolutely. I've worked with a, with a few different players around this, actually, where you talk about just like dealing with managers and dealing with coaches because they've, they've just created a, like a persona that the manager is untouchable and I'm, I'm frightened to, to go and talk to them. Did, like, how, what were your relationships like with managers? How did um, you deal with problems? Well, um, whether it's the era that I played in, but from as I was younger, as I got older, managers became more approachable. Now, is that because in the early 90s, managers were that type and not approachable? And as time evolved, managers were educated and trained on how to deal with players better. So they, they opened themselves up to be more approachable, perhaps. Um, on the whole, um, I would say less managers were approachable where you could have an adult conversation. They would use the conversation against you in some way. or you, I never really felt the opportunity to be able to open up completely to managers, hardly ever. So that, again, that's something a young player would certainly have to to bear in mind, I mean, if you're trying to prove yourself to to, to get into the first team, you, you do need to have some sort of uh, you do. Um, relationship what, with the manager. Yeah, and what I would probably do now, I, and it's easy saying as someone that's been retired for, for a number of years and, and can look back on everything, but, you know, there'd be times in my career if I was out of the team, I would I would not have any conversation with the manager. One, because the manager doesn't want to speak Really, he doesn't want me to put him on the spot. And I would I would very much now be proactive in finding reasons why I'm not playing, what can I work on, and, and really keeping that conversation going with the manager and really put it on them to tell me why I'm not in the team, what do I need to work on. If I was a young player starting out, that would be something that I would, or that would be something I would recommend to young players to do just to give them more of an idea and keep the conversation going. Although... So managers are just not open to these conversations. So it's yeah, it's choosing choosing your battles, I suppose, in that respect. But, yeah. but certainly, if if you are brave enough to have that conversation, then it can only be helpful. I would have thought because at least a manager can read you and they know exactly what you're thinking inside and they know yeah. you're, you're motivated. Yes, I think that it's, it's more that they know that you want to improve and they want to develop. And every manager wants to hear that from players, especially young players. From what Jamie said, 
it's clear to thrive in professional football, being confident in social situations, being able to assert yourself with coaches, with managers, with teammates is vitally important. And Jamie acknowledged that the culture in football has changed somewhat over the last decade or two. However, certainly from my experience of supporting professional and amateur footballers, some people do have more interpersonal confidence than others. And these athletes that are more confident in this sense are more likely to be more open, have more honest relationships and honest conversations. They're going to be much better at questioning other people and not necessarily in a critical way, but by questioning people so that they can get the best and the most from their talents. And often when you chat to professional athletes and former professional athletes, you find that when they get older, that's when they develop more confidence in themselves. They've been through more, so they feel more open to talk to coaches, to managers, to express themselves freely. But I want to try and get the point across to younger athletes that that doesn't have to be the case, that you have choices that you can make. You can develop that skill, and it is a skill And in the next bite, Paul McGee is going to go on and educate educate you on how to deal with people who perhaps intimidate you. Perhaps a a young aspiring athlete and you've got a a coach or a manager who's in charge of you, who you're intimidated by and you've put off and you've put off actually having a conversation with them. What advice would you give them in order to, to be able to improve that relationship? I think one of the things to think about is, you know, that intimidation. I I appreciate some people go out of their way to intimidate you, and that's not easy. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's reminding ourselves that we are all human, that we all have this limited amount of time on this planet, that whatever your job title is, whatever you've previously achieved, you still need to go to the toilet, you still need to, you know, hydrate, you still need to eat. We will still have all our flaws and our failings. It's just that some are good at hiding it more than others. And I and I so understand, first of all, that if you feel intimidated, that, that's because of how you've interpreted behaviour and their position in your own head. So first of all, you can work on your own mindset, I think. And secondly, you know, I, I think maybe it's not a question of going out to impress everybody all the time, but it's about... It's about things like if you get a chance to talk to someone, this is not a chance for you to impress them with, let me tell you all about me. But most people, David, let's be honest, as I'm I'm doing now, most people quite like to talk a bit about themselves when it's appropriate and if if we've got the time to do so. So even just asking, you know, boss, you know, how long have you been in, in, in management? You know, what was your first job like? You know, showing some interest in other people. Um, can be helpful when it's appropriate. You've got to think about the time and the context clearly. But that's a way of finding out, you know, what would you say, boss, would you say the three main lessons you've learned from being a manager or a leader, what would they be? Uh, You know, it's like show some interest in them, not you just think I've got to impress you. Well, show some interest rather than think you've got to impress. So I think that, that can play a part. And also, ultimately, I think actions do speak louder than words. And so I it's like there's a, I was listening to a, a podcast with um Casper Schmeichel, uh, the Leicester City goalkeeper. And he says what's really interesting, he says every Leicester manager who's come in to uh into the club has dropped a player who they got on a free transfer from Aston Villa called Marcus Albrighton. Now, what's interesting about Marcus is he just keeps on working hard, showing up, working hard, showing up. And every manager who's been at the club, whilst Marcus Albrighton's been at the club, has eventually brought him back into the team. And so I think sometimes it's not just about what you say, it's about what you do. But if you are going to say something, treat this person as a human rather than as a title. And if you think you can ask them a question, if it's appropriate to learn more about them, you'll often find people actually like talking a bit about themselves. I like that. And that, that again, all starts with what you mentioned there about interpretation and 
the, the little voice on your on your shoulder. Absolutely. Absolutely. I got years ago, I, I was asked to be an MC stroke compare at um at a charity event. And the speakers that night included David Cameron and Theresa May. And I had to introduce them. They were talking a few years ago. Labour was still in power. So it was um well, it was one would have been pre-2015. And um, but I am, you know, speaking, I'm, I'm with the leader of the Conservative Party, David Cameron. And and I didn't realise at the time, but the future two future prime ministers. And at one stage, as we, we before the event started and I'm chatting to them, I'm like feeling whoa, a little bit out of my depth here. And there were various other politicians there and, you know, government officials and leaders of commerce do you know what, David? I went to the toilet and I didn't need to go to the toilet. And I just went to the toilet, just have a conversation with myself and go, OK, this is a great opportunity. Remember the, 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 the privilege of pressure. Remember they're only human. Um, you know, and, and just in a sense, get a bit of a grip, mate, get a bit of a grip. And I had to give myself a good talking to. So and that helped. I introduced them. I started having a bit of a banter with them. Um, you know, I remember um, Ian Duncan Smith was there as well. He gets chatting to me. And and then I thought, you know what? We're all human and we've all got our uh, vulnerabilities. So um, let's just recognise that rather than keep putting people on a pedestal and elevating them too much in our own mind to the point where we feel intimidated by their presence. So on that theme, then, if... <sighs> Thinking about the whole use of social media and the media right now, and as we know, a lot of the people that might be listening might well be athletes. Consider you're in that that position there where you're introducing David Cameron and Theresa May and you mess mess it all up. You have a terrible performance in some people's eyes and you get a whole lot of trolls on social media. Um, Yeah, how how are you going to deal with that? Okay, I mean, uh, and, and those... It wasn't messed up, but life sometimes we will mess up, and I get that. We, if you're in sport, you might have a bad day. Um, a, a certain footballer once said to me, and it's worth again, it comes down to mindset. You know, he said to me, as I was talking about the inner critic with him, you know, imagine him with this big red boxing glove, you beat yourself up, and he said, you know what? If I have a bad game, I will beat myself up for a couple of hours, but then I say to myself, just because you had a bad game doesn't make you a bad player. And I think sometimes we need to acknowledge that we might have had a bad game or we might have had a bad day or a bad performance, but that doesn't mean you are therefore bad. It's like, as a parent, I might sometimes in the past have said something to my kids and then regretted it. doesn't mean I'm a bad parent. It just means maybe I had a bad day or a bad five minutes. So first of all, you know, get a little bit of perspective. And, and I would say, try and have a conversation with your inner coach rather than your inner critic. Secondly. Um, I think we, we sometimes we just need to acknowledge that we can get a bit super defensive when we're being criticised. But we've got to say to ourselves is, OK, whose voice are we listening to? Because if you've got a coach, I'm thinking particularly in a sporting context, and they challenge you, then maybe their voice is worth listening to. So I'm not going to say to you, don't take it personal, just ignore it. No, 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 no. If your coach is saying, come on. There were certain things that didn't go so well today. Be prepared to listen. But if it's Dave, the car mechanic from Dudley, tweeting about you and about your performance, well, hang on a minute. You want to get better. You know, would you be approaching this random stranger on social media, Dave from Dudley, about how to improve? Would you be seeking advice from this person? If the answer is no, then ask yourself this. Why would I take criticism and believe criticism from somebody I'd never take advice from? Why would I take criticism from a, from someone I wouldn't take advice from? So think about that for a start and think, well, I won't go to advice from them, so why am I taking criticism from them? But if I'm being challenged by my coach, by a confidant who knows me well and who has my best interests at heart, then maybe I do need to listen to that. But sometimes you just got to go easy on the boxing glove and go, you know what? OK, it was just a bad day. Of course, it's also worth thinking, all right, on a scale of one to 10, where 10's death, where is it? 
you know, Steve Peters, who um, wrote the book The Chimp Paradox, talked about what Chris Hoy talks about his relationship with Steve Peters, who was used by um, by the British Olympic Association, the cycling team. And one of the things that Chris Hoy said about your conversation with Steve Peters is Steve Peters said, let's just get this all in perspective, Chris. You're riding a book, you're riding a bike around in circles. That's it. You're not performing life changing, life saving operation on somebody's brain. You're on a bike going round and round. So let's get that into perspective to begin with. So on a scale of one to ten, where it sends death, where is it? How important will it be in six months' time? I can tell you this now. Theresa May and, and David Cameron and Ian Duncan Smith aren't going to remember the day they met Paul McGee all those years ago. So let's also get a few other things in perspective. But also, if you have screwed up or someone's challenged you, OK, what can I learn from this? Is there anything to learn? And what would I do differently next time? So I think what happens sometimes is, uh, uh, you know, so it's very easy to say, well, ignore the trolls. Well, ignore anybody whose advice you wouldn't go to. But secondly, if you are being challenged and in inverted commas criticised, maybe there is a there is a, a seed of truth in that criticism that we can learn from. So be prepared to learn from it. I'm pleased to announce a new sponsor for the show, Chimera Sport, who produce a range of sportswear and equipment to enhance performance and recovery, reducing injury occurrences. You'll find on the product section of our website, www.sport-excellence.co.uk backslash products, access to our own Chimera Sport Shop. I've personally tested some of the garments and you'll find that the infrared sportswear has been clinically tested too. So it's great for fitness enthusiasts and athletes who want to push harder, go further and recover quicker. Paul's advice was very poignant and I'd like you to consider, you know, where, where do you get in your own way? Do you perhaps lose perspective? Do you let your inner critic take over and stop you from having some important conversations? If you do, why not get a piece of paper out and do a little exercise now? Consider a person that you would like to talk to and start writing a letter to them. And in that letter, make a note of different questions that you want to ask them. Write down, you know, what's stopping you, what your fears are, what your worries are about actually asking these questions to that person. It's a nice little exercise for you. It won't take very long and it will help you gain a fresh perspective. And in Paul's words, it'll allow your inner coach to come out. And On the topic of coaching, the quality of a great coach is to consider whether your communication is actually aligned with what the individuals and the team are trying to achieve. Is your communication actually supporting success? And next up, Mark Bennett goes on to share some ideas around that. It's going to help coaches, parents and leaders and some athletes too. Athletes will certainly benefit. Athletes will certainly see if their coaches are well-educated and are consistent in their approach or whether they would benefit from actually listening to Mark's pearls of wisdom. You didn't attain higher levels to to be able to reflect and to to learn from mistakes, learn to to adapt their their daily behaviours. Yeah, it's... uh... One of the challenges and frustrations I have um, within a lot of sports that I see from the outside and in business and even in schools is we expect people to make effective decisions under different variety of pressure, make great choices, being able to commit to them and then evaluate them without getting caught up in the outcome. But we don't teach it to them. So we kind of, if you said to anybody, I mean, you said to a goal for a basketball player, you know, a pole vault or anybody says, right, uh, I want you to be better within your skill, but we're not going to practice that. I just expect you to do that straight away. Everyone would laugh at you. So no, 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 we need to spend time. We need to be patient. We need to progress this as well. If you want people to think in a certain way, effectively make great choices based on what they see, you know, scan, be in present, make good choices, commit to them with intent, without fear, review the choice, the execution separately. You need to train them 
and develop an environment where actually we'll practice that above anything else until you can start being more effective at that because that's going to be key for their success now and in the future, even with kids. So for me, I, I developed an action review process that I recommend to every coach. So look, overtly share this with your players. Let them know the value of it. Make sure they make the connection. And that's your framework. So just say, I want you to think like this all the way through. I'll never get frustrated if you make a poor choice, but we won't review a choice if you don't commit to it. But if you do, we've got a framework. We can review the choice and the execution in a dialogue. So instead of having a ask players lots of questions which sometimes sometimes you flog on a dead horse because they're just waiting for you to ask a question we teach them the action review process so then so they know look all i'm after is a review you know what the review is now so now we're listening we've given them an answering framework as opposed to we having a question framework we can listen if there's a bit of gray we can delve in but it's allowing them to think in an effective way and not wait for the rubber necking, as I call it, looking to coach. Is that okay? Learn answers. What does coach want me to say now, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, developing action review process is not just important for sport, but just in life skills, making great decisions and reviewing them. And that's a process they can repeat and repeat yep. uh, by themselves as well, away from, away yep. from the coach. 100%. And I would imagine as well it would be quite a useful tool for parents. Oh, it's huge. I mean, a lot of the things we're talking about here, David, uh, and all of the stuff in PDS, really, which is my system, it's people skills. It's not contextual. It can be anywhere. So I always say to coaches, they get caught up in they want to develop the players and their growth mindset. But actually, the first thing I look at is, as you as a coach, are you living the very behaviors that are allowing you to be a great coach? If you need a change, are you and every are you committing to that change? Are you following an action review process? So once we can get them to understand that actually you can't just turn it on when you turn up for a practice session. You need to connect with it. It's a life skill. And the more you use it in everyday life, the more comfortable and more skillful you'll become at it. So it can't be a turn on and off thing. It's got to be a value of life thing as a person. And that's when it becomes impactful. Going back to the, the whole parents thing then, so what advice would you actually give to parents in order to help their, help their kids make the leap up from, you know, when, they, when they're, say, transitioning from academies into professional sport? I think it's going to be huge for any parent. I think it's the same with coaches, teachers, parents. Is If it's a coach, identify all the influences of parents being one. And if you're just looking at a parent, it's just to, just to say, look, It doesn't matter what age they go to. You need to prepare them that the environment they go into may not be the most flourishing one. What I mean by that is they may have a coach now that is very athlete-centered, need-centered, get them to think for themselves, et cetera. They may then move to another coach and they're very dictatorial, old-school coach, just telling them what to do. So what we've got to say to them is, look, you're in charge of the choices you make. And actually, I'm really interested as a parent in supporting you based on the informed choices you make. So I need to understand if I'm going to have a conversation with my child, am I in the right state to start the conversation? Have we pre-agreed certain behaviors for myself as a parent and for my child that we'll agree that we'll abide by to help each other be great communicators and understand each other? So that's back to that Stephen Covey first understand then be understood. Then just share with them is if it's pre-agreed, we always review that. But also what I want to do is when we have a conversation, I'm really interested in your opinion first of your commitment to the choices. And and it goes back to David, if someone, you know, if their child has just played in a match, whatever sport it is, it's not about asking questions about did you win or how did you do or how many minutes did you play on the pitch? It's all about to one, enjoyment. But secondly, it's all about to, okay, what was the most challenging thing that you experienced today? You know, what did you learn today? And then using that action review process, if they go, well, I'm not sure, you know, what I did. So well, what were your options? Okay, so if there were your options, what did you go for? Would you, did you commit to the choice you made? Awesome. Now, now, based on what you know, would you change anything? So all of a sudden now, we're having a quality conversation that is more about listening than the wise, all-powering parents always needing to have the answers. Because as we know, David, and, you know, the longer it takes, the harder it is to think back to a child. But remember, childs have great minds. They have great opinions. And often they're less blocked than, than we are. They were the people that were there. We weren't. They saw everything we didn't. And what we want to understand is, 
I want to know what you're thinking from your angle, from your viewpoint. So if I can start a dialogue that actually my my child always knows, I really value them, but I'm really inquisitive and I'm really interested about the choices they're made and their commitment to them, then actually the dialogue becomes more enriched and we don't get the child just just doing the fast one word answers to the parent trying to draw some information out of the child. It's fascinating having this conversation about parents because so when you look on the sidelines and football, rugby, whatever sport it is, you just see their, their emotion levels just go up so yeah. high and they just can't rationally think and, and question yeah. in this way. Yeah, because, I mean, the big problem we have is uh, across the board is what we don't ask ourselves is simple questions. And for me, one of the simple questions is what is success? So you've got to ask yourself as a parent, what is success for you and what is success for your child? And recognize, actually, when you go to the sport, it's what's success for the child. And if we want the child to flourish and use sport, one, they enjoy it and keep in sport, but also use it as a a life development skill, then what we've got to say is actually them being engaged, them being present, them helping their teammates be the best they can be, and them being the best they can be is success. Them making choices and committing to them is success. The scoreline is nothing to do with that. The ref decisions are nothing to do with that. It's everything to do with those elements. So if if we as a parent go, well, that's success for the child, then we ask ourselves, how can I support my child to be the best they can be on that pitch? All of a sudden now, I'm thinking differently to what I see. Now, if I'm going there and go, it's all about the winning and you've got that confirmation bias anyway, anything my child does, it's great. Anybody else, you know, it's terrible. Or the opposite of, well, actually, they're okay for kids, but what, kid, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do that? Go over there, sprint over here. Actually, now we're part of the problem. We're not part of the solution. So if we can define what success is first, and then when you develop that good rapport with your child, or you know, the same as any coaches with players, we need to ask them, you know, if we go into a game, what do you want from me? And, and they might go, just be silent, dad. Just be silent, mum. You know, you know, that's it. That would be great for me. And then you go, no problem. I've, I've got you. Fist punch, you know, whatever it is, bang, I've got you. That's what I'm here for. I'm, a, I'm here to help you be the best you can be. What does that look like for you? And that's, that's kind of, I know it's a simplistic version. There's more to it than that. But that's what we need to get to, David. Listening to Mark there, it made me think about when you're self-conscious, when you worry too much about what other people think. When this happens, there can be an awful lot going on internally in your brain, your worries. And your worries can then turn into anxiety. And day in, day out, if you're thinking these things, you begin to hypnotize yourself into thinking that you're not good enough and you can go on to put people on a pedestal. And this is so important for people who struggle with communication, with asserting themselves to realize that often it's actually them, they're getting in their own way. And it can be a challenge too for parents, for coaches, for leaders to recognize that when people don't actually speak up, it's not because they're not motivated, it's actually because they're frightened to. And then that fear can mean that they get anxious and they're actually overthinking things and they lose perspective. And certainly in this episode, I'm hoping that you'll have taken on board some of Jamie's experiences and Mark and Paul's advice. And I'd be really interested to know your thoughts on the topic, your ideas. How do you help give people a voice so that they can feel more confident to express themselves so that they don't get intimidated by people so that they can approach different people? Because let's face it, that's what it's all about. That's what freeing people, that's what will help free people up and have more confidence in themselves. And if freeing yourself up is something that you feel is important, that you could benefit, why not have a look at my recently released online accelerator course? In the course, you're going to have the opportunity to learn more about yourself, your support system, positives and negatives of that support system and really take the bull by the horns and go after your goals. All of this is in 60 minutes on the course, and it's set up to help you succeed and succeed faster. In there, there's a range of exercises and tools that can assist you in your chosen sport and life and give you a nice nudge forward, helping you if you're feeling a bit lost or stuck. 
So go on, check out my website, the three w's.sport-excellence.co.uk under products, and you'll see in there an online accelerator course. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. The Sport-Excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.